And what they're doing is they're using the power of data to really to transform the music industry. Uh, they, they, they track every fan interaction uh, across every artist in the world. So you're talking about links, uh, sales, purchases, plays, listens, and they capture all of this data in just massive amounts. And you think about how much that is on a daily basis that they just farm all of that into a system. And then they aggregate that data and use it to provide business intelligence to people who really need about need it. And we're talking about bands, managers, labels, distributors, brands, the artists themselves. They can use this information to make decisions on where they're going to go next, which you know areas they should move into, uh, you know sales, you know sales strategies, things like that. They are have gotten so good that they can actually tell you who's going to be in the top ten charts next month. <laughs> So they got this predictive analytics, which is really cool. So Mike Petrovich, he is very great. Mike. <laughs> so Mike is our guest speaker from the Epic Sound. Uh, he is a software engineer, uh, and he drives all the fun in engineering. He's also done some previous work with Disney and AYI.com. Uh, he has given multiple presentations. So uh, he's a uh, seasoned speaker, if you will. Uh, so there's his LinkedIn uh, address there, uh, and his Twitter, and his GitHub. So if you want to check out his code, we'll have GitHub. Uh, slideshow will be on my website, so you can download it. You, get, you, you don't have to write down the links now. You can just get it on my website. So, uh, And with that, we'll go ahead and get started. So I'm going to turn it over to Mike. Uh, and uh, you guys enjoy yourselves. And it's an open forum, so you guys have questions anytime. Just go ahead and ask. And at the end of it, we're going to open it up for an open forum so there can be discussions and whatnot. So. Mike, it's all yours. So I'm just going to hand you the course. Challenge 
So the way we've been thinking about it is using the data pyramid. It's like the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, but for data. And when most people talk about big data, they talk about this bottom line right here, just the raw metrics, like 22,000 sound cloud players. But that's just very basic. And with that by alone is not, not helpful. The next level up is the information layer. And that's, let's say, you know, what's the breakdown across different demographics, different dimensions, you know? Who on Spotify is listening to Lady Gaga, or Lord, or reading this book? So it's a little more informed data, kind of, kind of combining different metrics and uh, dimensions. Above that, we have knowledge. And this is being able to uh, look at data and explain why it's behaving the way it is. So looking at a spike in a graph and being able to say, oh, it's because of this thing over here that relates to it. It's about correlating different data sets that might otherwise seem disparate. And finally, the top of the pyramid is intelligence. And this is being able to predict the next, the next big hit that you want to partner with and uh, reap the rewards. And being able to use your knowledge, information, and data to predict where you should go next. So this is, this is our goal, to get to intelligence. How businesses um, make the right moves to help their businesses and put it in the right direction. So these needs can be applied to any industry. And today I'm going to talk about one particular use, use case around visualization. Um, this is like a basic graph, a time series graph of some, met some two metrics. And this could be anything. This could be music play, this could be sales, this could be um, book sales, this could be anything. In this case, this is uh, Lord Sound Health Plays and her iTunes sales. And you show this graph to anybody, and the first thing they're going to ask is, what happened here? Why is there a huge spike? And so this alone, this graph alone, is in kind of information layer. It's showing what happened across some particular network. But we want some knowledge. We want to know, why did this spike up? What happened there? So how do we get there? So we've, oops. To get there, we have to show you different ways. Can everyone see this? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So this is the same graph you saw earlier. This is our graph product. This is something our clients have access to to be able to take any time series data and plot it against each other and kind of play with the data and the data ranges. But to find out what happened here, a while ago, we thought, okay, it's probably related to some event that happened, right? Like she won a tour, she gave an interview, something happened. So we said, okay, let's let's put like a list of all the events that we've been capturing. Because we also go out to different event sources, you know, all across the web news, Facebook, anything to grab actual events, you know, like what happened on, on those days. <laughs> We're serving up this feed here that kind of says you know, what's kind of going on in the day. Like our key press mention is a post. Here, concert. So this was this is our first attempt at kind of visualizing uh, this, these events to help identify what what causes that spike. But as you can see, it's it's not really yeah. It's hard to tell you know just looking at okay what's going on. So you have to go through each one and see if it makes sense and alert. Sound club is off. You know there's nothing. It's not very self-explanatory. How how's it working? And, but this isn't the first time anyone's ever had to show kind of events data combined with actual some time series metric. Google, um, Google Finance does something similar where you can see the actual events that happened over the course of the stock ticker price. Um, and this, so this is a kind of similar problem, but not exactly the same. But this by itself was not great. So recently we decided to to take this data and you know what, why don't we just throw this on an actual graph with this only time series and see what it looks like. So imagine if each one of these events was a point on the graph. Maybe we could see some clustering that help inform kind of where we should look. So we tried that. And this is what we got. So this is each one of these events is a single data point here. And we can see it has some interesting uh, shapes and Clustering. There's a lot of stuff going on here. 
and a lot of different events. Also, we can have, we can filter. Okay, let's see. You know, let's see. Release. Okay, so should I release here? That might explain it. You now, okay. you can see a bunch of different releases, but on the 27th, whereas the spike actually happened on the first. So, like, what happened on the first? You can see <coughs> right here. Oh, it's not, not a release. So you kind of have to go through and figure out. It's going T. I'm cool. Right there, you see something suspicious. And um, whatever happened on this day coincided with this huge spike. And there it is, late night with Jimmy Fallon. Which uh, was part of a lot of other research we found. When you release an album, you should go on late night TV right away to really capitalize on that. Because that spiked her sales and her SoundCloud. So that, that was really interesting. <laughs> At the same time though, David Letterman, not so much. Probably <laughs> 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 well, he's not on there anymore. So this, this by kind of showing the visual, it's a lot easier to see what's going on. So, same thing. Oh, here. So if we do the same thing for Iggy Azalea, well, it gets a little crazy because. These are all her Instagram posts. She loves to post, let me tell you. Like, it is, it is there like an X, Y axis to that? Yeah, oh yeah. It's, so, it's just stacking, so it doesn't overlap. So you can actually see. So it's one, one, one. Ah, okay. And if you go down, you'll see right here. She had posted a ton of stuff on her There it is. So all of those are one day's worth of posts for her? Uh, probably. For that one vertical column you had? Yeah, let's see. Let's just wow. filter by post. Well, so we take out post. Oh, much more manageable. 423, 423. Yeah, all these things are. Yeah, these what did you settle on for charting? What's that? What did you settle on for charting? What library did you settle on for charting? Oh, this is all D3. So this is just for all these D3. Stuff. I think we were we were using uh, something like Rickshaw, which is the layer on top of D3 before, but that caused problems. And what, why did you get rid of it? I think there was uh, there were bugs in it that we had to go to actual source to fix, and it was just one more layer of abstraction that didn't help us in the end. Did you um, already have kind of existing D3 skill set, or did you have to kind of onboard that skill? Uh, well, me personally, I have to learn D3. I'm coming on to this because I I never used D3 before. Actually, the learn is part of the the interview, the, the, there's a coding challenge that we do for an interview, and one of them is to make an interesting visualization so using D3 and, and uh, some other tools. So I didn't know D3, so I'm going to learn that as part of it, which is interesting. Did they give you a heads up that you need to know before the interview? No, so you have like 24 hours to, oh, okay. to do it. So. <laughs> they, they don't want to keep anything right here. So yeah, in terms of just Right on the graph, well, this approach has its limitations. So sure, you can start filtering, but what if posts are important to you? Then you can't really look, this is not helpful to look at. So, we started iterating, and we thought, okay, well, let's start combining events on the same day. And so, when we do that, so this is what I had before the same kind of graph. When we start combining, it looks much more manageable. And it's hard to see there. Maybe, you know, that's, oh, I'm trying to see in there. Yeah. You can see here, but the, the events with uh, the days of multiple events, there was a number with the number of events there. When you click it, you can actually see the different ones and select what you want to show. How, how did you gather the events that are relevant to the industry? So that is, it's a similar problem to the way we actually get the data, the actual, um, and we leverage a lot, we leverage crawling for a lot of our data capture. So we crawl specific sites that talk about um, the different artists or events. Facebook, for example, we just grab events off their feed. So that we consider their feed, their, their news feed, and Twitter or Facebook as actual just event data. So whenever they post something on Instagram, we consider that an event. Um, but we also we also have several other sources for getting releases and press mentions. 
challenging part though is actually getting accurate release dates um, because there's no central repository of this album was released on this date. You, know, you have to use a lot of leading signals like, oh, the huge spike in consumption on this date or mentions on, on this date and kind of use that as your release date. Are those formulas that you had to develop in house to kind of build a consensus on, you know, for example, the release date example? You probably have to look at different clues and build some sort of consensus what you're going to call the release date. You have to do that in house. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's still, it's imperfect. Yeah. Um, just like yeah. uh, combining tracks and albums. So <coughs> we have this uh, big problem we're tackling this quarter, actually, where an artist will release an album that has a dozen tracks, right? But on each service, on Spotify, iTunes, on Rhapsody, well, not anymore, but they had a completely different name, like slightly different name in those backend systems and in, in all the feeds and APIs we used to get those data. So to us, it looked like they had 40 tracks, and we only had a dozen on that one album because they're all named differently. So we have to use a lot of fuzzy matching and a lot of manual creation too. We have to do just to combine those tracks to make sure that when an artist is looking at the data, it's actually accurate. So that's a big challenge. Um, okay, it's, it's a mess up there. Do you, do you um, are there any sites that you scrape that they don't want you to scrape? Um, well, I mean, it's hard. It would be hard for anyone to stop every set. Yeah. Well, 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 right. But I mean, they, they can like read your rate and then ban you, ban your ID. Oh, so like so many guys like uh, Facebook, or Twitter. We have they have explicit rate limits, and we wrote our crawlers to kind of respect those rate limits and not get throttled out. But once in a while, we do get a bunch of error emails saying we got rate limited by one service or another. Okay, so that, that's your that's the imagined rate limit. Right? What's that? That's how you imagine, you imagine most of these rate limit. Yeah, yeah, just kind of spreading it out enough so we can get the data fast enough. Do you have any um, real time components in your dashboards? Um, no. We, well, so the closest thing we have, every all our data is um, a day old. So the data you will never see today's data. It always takes you'll see it tomorrow. It takes about twenty four hours for the crawlers to run. And get it to sanitize all the data. So it does take, well, there's a, a lag. We don't have real time data, and I don't know if we have the work because it yeah, does. I mean, it's probably not going Yeah, it's not. You, you, it looks cool. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. To see, oh, someone's listening to a song here. And I'm sure Spotify and Shazam have made real time dashboards because they're plugged right into their um, APIs. But we crawl a lot of stuff, even though we do have direct access to Spotify, to um, and YouTube, I think. So, so when we start collapsing, this visualization is a well, yeah, it's, broken. it's a little better. Um, to go back to the Iggy Azalea example with this, we start collapsing events in the same day. It's way more manageable, and it's hard to see here. Um, These are all pluses. These games are like 24 events on one day. You know, all these retweets and posts. Um, so this, this definitely, this is our, this is I think our latest iteration. Uh, this is live on the site right now. This is how we, how we can manage this. So if we want to see like what happened here with this spike, we can, it's a little bit, a little bit more, a little easier to see. Uh, um, but we're going to continue to iterate on this. This, this manual process of finding on the right what happened right there is still manual. To go to each one and see if it makes sense for it to be you know, a causal relationship or not. Like that. So, do you track um, shares? So, like, if I link to a SoundCloud on Twitter, uh, do you track that? Uh, let's find out. Plays, followers, comments, downloads. I don't think we have shares, no. Unless it's or like if I wrote a blog entry about you know this, this next hot single um, on uh, Bandcamp. I mean, is that gonna, is there the type of things to kind of like crawl the the, the greater web and find this stuff? Oh, like kind of make those inferences. Yeah. The relational inferences. No, we don't. We don't currently do that. Um, even for Twitter, where we've been talking about that right now, you have to actually. 
directly mention the artist in order to reconsider the text, yeah, the text yeah. versus yeah. just having the text. Because a lot of different artists or authors have the same name. So it's kind of ambiguous. Mm -hmm. And then they get misattributed to the wrong person. So it's a, it's a very common problem. So it's not clear really cut. Um, so that was, that was the kind of, uh, that was the interesting visualization problem we had, just kind of showing a time series of events above the actual data that it could affect. Um, another problem that we, uh, challenge that we've been uh, working with one of our clients to solve is this. So this is a report that one of, uh, one of our book publishing clients put together for their own internal teams, where they took a screenshot of our graph, and then add these little man manually added these little annotations explaining this event happened here, there, all over. And like these are and so in contrast with music um, um, clients and record labels, uh, rather artists, most of the events um, for music are like single day. You know, it all happened one day. But for book publishers, there's a lot of multi-day events, like advertising campaigns that last a month or a book expo the last three days. And we need a way of capturing that too. Before, we would actually just copy the event for each day. And so it would be a, the books at expo on every single day. But it wasn't clear that that was all just the same event. So that's what you know, our client was trying to capture with kind of this visualization here. Um, and so they kept doing that. They even went so far as to actually mock up our interface, taking individual screenshots, pasting them in, <laughs> And doing all this stuff. And that's really solid. This is crazy. This is a lot of work, you know? And this is still not very readable. You know, get it, you know, what is this? And by the time you find it, you forget what you're looking for. And it, it's not easy. It's not, it's not obvious. Um, so we wanted to make their lives easier and make something that helps, um, helps the whole platform. So let me, you've already seen a little piece of that here. So, um, let, me, let me just turn on the zoom so that everyone can see. So here, let's say um, I want to annotate, let's say, uh, this book, this book, oh. so the annotation is click, it appears here. Yeah, that's for adding multiple ones. Um, if there if there's a date, if you saw this before, you can you can pick one from the set of multiple. This was especially challenging because um, we had to make it work in an automated fashion, not just all they all appear on top of each other. And here we have this, just like how we stack these clouds and they don't overlap, we have to do the similar thing here, um, where we're, it's the kind of like a um, knapsack problem in the sense of stacking boxes so they don't overlap. So you can and this is all D3 right here? We, yeah, we use D3 to, to actually render. This is all HTML, it's not SVG or anything. This is right. all, but we're using D3 to manipulate the data and to lay everything out. And a specialized algorithm that will lay out these, these annotations in an optimal way so that they, help, they, they reduce the height. So they don't make the page scroll 20 pages. And they, you can still screenshot this and print it. So this is a, a little bit easier than like this stuff. Hey Mike, for those that don't know, can you give sort of a quick description of what D3 is? Oh, okay. So D3, think of it like, uh, is anyone familiar with the jQuery? Is there anyone here who doesn't know what jQuery is? Okay. Well, D3 is like jQuery for, uh, specifically for, for rendering data sets for data bits. And um, so it has a lot of functionality that makes it easy to create graphs and 
and charts and a lot of different stuff that is a very manual process in something like jQuery. So it's a very similar concept. Can I, can I chime in? It also has a number of kind of data processing techniques. So, you can, uh, so it's really big into the idea of mapping through your data to create sub data sets to then display. So it's, it's a lot more powerful than it like that officially looks, but it's, it, it, it is complicated. Does it actually hold data? Data sets? Um, that well, it won't, it won't hold like, I mean, you still have to represent it as, as JavaScript, but it, it, it will help you break it apart and into So it's a data processing engine, basically. Yes. It's a data slicing yeah. engine, okay. essentially. So, so you, you can feed it you know, your, your, your raw data and then use it to analyze it and break it up into different parts. And okay, so it's actually holding the, the broken apart yes. chunks of data. Yes. Okay. Yeah. But, but it exists in its own little world, though. It's like, yeah. it's just kind of, it's, it uses HTML technology, so you don't have to worry about it too much, like messing with other things, but it is kind of its own kind of uh, self-contained world. So also, did you, did your company ever go into some of the off-the-shelf, like, you know, players that are out there, like the, the Oracle OVIEs, the Tableaus, those tools, you obviously gravitate towards kind of the web interface. Was there kind of a, a rhyme or reason behind that decision? We could all... <coughs> Probably because we want to um, be able to expose, expose that product to our cl uh, clients as well, not just as an internal tool. Right. And most yeah. of those companies now have web versions that promote some mobile web and also desktop. I just didn't know if it had something to do with customization. Well, that's a big part of it. Um, because we're still a small company. We're about less than 25 uh, people total. We're a small, small engineering team. So, we didn't have the budget for something that had probably. And just the level of customization, because that's like that's like a Microsoft Word. You can do anything, but to do one thing, you just you can't do it up. To do a dashboard, what's the, the typical like resource breakup? Like I've got a, a front end web developer, I've got a data person, like what's kind of your team normally? Does everyone in the company work on it or do you kind of separate into smaller a group, you know, of three or four people, and they kind of build a dashboard. Does that question make sense? Yeah, yeah. Our, our teams typically operate small teams, maybe mm -hmm. up to three or four at most. And usually, if it's like say a client-facing feature, like like this, for example, I worked I worked with uh, one of the guys who was more on the data and API side. He, he kind of massaged the data and API in a way that made it easy for me to work on the front end part of this. Maybe design might like, come and chime in once in a while to help out, help do the new X and design. But generally, it's small experts. Um, we just and we kind of each go off and do our work and come back, talk about what we want to do, and you know, carry on nothing like that. I, I have another question. I hope it's great that we talk too much. Is um, you're returning a lot of data to the screen there, and so I like one thing that I do is like business intelligence dashboards and stuff, right? And if it's hooked like right into our like kind of OLAP database, then you know it might take like it, it you know you know I have a trade off to make between the performance of the actual like database cluster and actually giving the user the flexibility to like play with the dashboard and move it around or whatever. And I feel like I um, because I'm not um, I'm kind of looking at like oh well I need like to use a, I need to use Ajax basically. I need to use asynchronous JavaScript. So I was wondering, like, about the challenge of moving a lot of data. Like, it's not a traditional, like, you know, um, database problem where you know ten rows of need to be pulled out for a user, run through a backend, and then display. It's like it seems to me that there's a lot of data, which is more of like an analytic. Yeah, it's much more, much more. Um Dynamic and interactive. Do you hold the data in D3, or do you, are you going back to the database and pulling data as you interact? So what I'm doing, what we're trying to do, it's not we're not there yet. This is actually the oldest page on the whole product by a couple of years. Ironically, this is the most used page, but it's the oldest. Um, but what we what we try to do is get the minimum amount of data necessary to render a usable view. Get the uh, critical path to render as fast as possible. Um, and we get that data from the API. 
and then we aggressively cache after that. So this data I have here, if I scrub, if I scrub this mini map, and you'll see if I scrub over here, you see there's a gap here because I have a load of these events. And I'm like, well, it's going to take a second. Um, and it's going to load in these couple ones. And now I'm going to scroll back. And, scroll back. Um, and that's why I think I'm caching that. Uh, you shouldn't have to do that. I see. Um, caching is working or is it? Yeah, it's, it's flaky. This is real, this is old backbone code. It's like 2,000 lines long. It's, it's a mess. We've been refactoring into Angular. So a lot of tricks. I mean, like that you have to. It's part of what you're doing is obscuring that latency. Yeah, and we try to minimize it as much as possible. Right. Um, and you know, everything from making the whole Apple single page application so we can cache across an entire user session ah. um, to just optimizing what our API needs. I think the right one example is right now this is a net feed. See when I click, and you can see the details here. Um, this is a text detail saying you know, what the category of this event, actual like detailed text. Here are a bunch of events. I think you saw before, but some of them have, have images. But we, right now, we're actually fetching that whole list with all the content on the initial load. And that's a lot of data. It's a couple that's actually like a mega of data. There's stuff that you won't see until you actually click. So that's one big optimization we haven't made yet. Whereas this is a lot faster. A good way to quantify the dimension of day is when you're trying to work with gigs or more of data. Have you had that encountered that problem yet? Um, we pre-process, right? I mean, you must have a data like ingestion, and then you have a database to run this. That's like must be pre, you know. Do you have anything like pre-aggregated in a cache anywhere uh, by artist, by day, by something? Like not waiting for users to actually make the requests too. So what we do, um, thankfully, well, all the so we have a lot of relational data in MySQL. Um, but the actual like values themselves are served up by this Java um, API, and that actually goes through another PHP layer. And I think at that PHP layer, um, I haven't looked at the code in a while, but we. No, we don't do any, I don't think we do any crazy caching there. I think we're, 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 we're lucky enough that um, for small data sets, it's, not, it's very manageable. Because look, we don't have too many data points here. If I created a report with 50 rows, right. then it would be slow. But what we do is actually we, we fetch them in batches. Like rather than get the whole report data at once, which is going to kill the server, it's going to run out of memory and time out. Is we fetch little batches. So if I were to load up a new a bigger report, you'd see this data come in little by little. So like batching is one way to, to do that. Um, but yeah, we try to pre-process as much as we can on the server to format it to get only the data that we need to show on the client. Um, so the trick is very, very specific filtering. Yeah, yeah. You only send the data you need. Because the server can process this crap way faster than the client can fetch stuff and then process and filter itself. And you see server, are you talking about the database server or some other server? Anything that's on your, uh, that's on the client's stack, it's on the client side. So, so the database layer or um, the, counting, layer. the counting probably happens like in a pre kind of determined way, right? And the counts are probably dumped off to like some oh, other. Okay. I see what you're asking. Yeah, because it's yeah. not like you're running a query to say, hey, count all of this stuff here, you know? Yeah, we're not running some crazy, you know, act, you know, um, uh, map reduce every time. Right. We're, call. Okay. we're actually, uh, when our crawlers um, get the total data sources, they get the data, they actually build them, there's another process that runs these aggregations on a regular basis. So you have an aggregation store. So you've got the raw data which comes in. Is that going, like sort of walk us through the, the life cycle of the data. So you got the crawler that grabs it. Does that sort of, what's that pipeline look like? So I'll give you an example. For, let's say we're, we receive uh, iTunes sales from, from Sony. We, uh, it comes in a file usually every day. Sometimes they miss a day, they give us two days in one file the next day. And we take that file, we upload it to HDFS, and we, Run some some 
stuff that's a little, this is a little out of my wheelhouse, to be honest, where we run um, some stuff, I guess, in Pig, uh, Apache Pig is a language for mutated data sets using the SQL-like language. Um, and we, I guess we have some Java processes that take that data, um, extract the values based on the format of that file, and, and aggregate, I think it aggregates directly into um, a very easy data store. So unlike a lot of typical databases where the value in the database is the single, is the only value there. So if you write over it, that's it. The old value is lost. We actually version our data. So if we get a file that, uh, if we get, let's say, um, we get some data from Sony, so the sales were this much on this day. And then a week later, they come back and say, actually, no, we gave you the wrong file. Those numbers are wrong. If we didn't version our data, we'd be screwed. We'd have no way to back up those changes. But we actually version all of our data so that we can just apply that and um, somehow, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure how the update mechanism works, but we actually have a snapshot um, at each point. I can tell you how it works, even though I don't work there. Yeah. So I was actually uh, speaking with uh, Dave Zwieback, who is one of the uh, senior guys at the company. And what they're doing is they're doing data tagging. So for every data value that they get in, they, it gets tagged with a stamp. The time stamp some other metadata. And so what happens is, is when they do their calculations and aggregations of their data points, they're only looking at a specific time stamp across the board. So let's say they would get in a bunch of data for a particular artist, and then the next day they get in uh, a correction, a file with correction saying, that data was wrong, this is the right data. Instead of, like, like Mike said, instead of removing all that data, putting in all the new data, and then rerunning all these calculations, they just put that new data on top of the old data, and then whatever has changed, they just bump those timestamps forward uh, in all the other metadata, and then they recalculate based on that, so they don't have to redo all that data. Uh, the good thing is that if they ever decide they need to go back to a previous version, it's done in a snap. They can just set some metadata with a lookup value and say, go look at this other version, and they can calculate uh, at any point in time based on whichever version they want to use. So there actually is, uh, I think, a white paper or an article online. I'll post that link on my website also so you can see how they do some of that data tagging. Yeah, I'll post it too. I, that, that stuff is like I said, you know, my head, because it's, it's, you're like, I've got this API input. Yes. <laughs> That's cool. Um, it is interesting. I would be curious to see the white paper because the organization I work at, we have a three-tier architecture. It's more corporate, so it's a little bit more structured, but it's basically the three layers are staging, integration, and reporting. And the staging is like it implies we're capturing the raw data, storing it, then we're integrating it, finding common ground, you know, between the two, maybe applying some fuzzy logic to, you know, figure out, like you talked about releasing, maybe trying to line those up and take one. <clears throat> and then moving in more of a dimensional model that's more optimized for speedy reporting, aggregating. So I was kind of, I mean, you guys are obviously stuff and like, I heard you just mention some of the buzzwords that we're throwing out. It's not like you're using one set technology to, it seems like, organize the data in one set way. It looks like you're using multiple technologies to do it. Do you, do you know, you know, do you have anything similar to like what we just talked about? Like, do you house all your data in one raw area and then, hey, we move it to this other area or is it based more on the particular need for, for how you're using particular data? I think, um, yeah, I, I'm, I think we have, we have this process of, like I said, where you get the file from Sony, we actually upload it into this like, PFS store. Okay. And I think... Is that raw? I mean, not to go into details, but is that more of a raw store? It's, um, I think it's extracted, because every file, every company that gives us a file, it's in a different form. Yeah. So we have to extract the values that we care about, and then, then we throw it to a structured, um, structured form like the university of or something like that. And then we have other processes that actually reach out to that storage layer and pull out the data and start aggregating and storing the aggregation. So I think it is, I think it pretty sure it is multi-tier in order to satisfy the uh, that version requirement. But again, I'll send out the links too because I need to reread that. It's, it's a pretty hefty article. Uh, Interestingly enough, that particular article was exactly how I got introduced in the X Big Sound because I read the article and I went, that's cool. And I reached out to them and then we ended up talking to Mike and that's why he's here. Unfortunately, I'm talking about all the fun and stuff.
No, that's quite all right, because that's actually one of the big things while we're here. But I have a question. Mm -hmm. So, you know, obviously your tool, Next Big Sounds dashboard here, has gone through multiple evolutions. I mean, there's obviously hundreds and hundreds of hours of development time there. Um, so talk, can you talk about a little bit about some of the biggest challenges you faced of going from essentially zero, which is you just got raw data, uh, and dealing some with like, so what are some of the biggest challenges of, obviously you've got data volume challenges, you've got compute power for aggregation challenges, and then you've got lexical challenges because you're dealing with natural language processing. So can you talk about like, maybe name a couple of the biggest challenges that you faced, and so how did you tackle those in order to get to that point where you have that dashboard? Sure. So I think the, the, the number one biggest challenge by far is data confidence. Uh, we, we, need to be able, we need to be able to trust that our data is good and our clients need to be able to trust us that the data that you see here is accurate. Uh, so that is by far the biggest challenge that we have. Um, and it comes, it arises from anything, let's say, um, network outages, sound clouds down for a day, or we get rate limited, or one of our crawlers fails. And as an error, the format changes and something stops working. It's just normal bugs. Staying on top of that, uh, let's say a client doesn't give us a, a file in, in three days, and then our aggregations are off. So th those are some of the, the biggest data conference channels that, that we have. And um, for that, we actually, so it gives us some law company, a lot of this stuff is kind of Everyone, everyone is very uh, multidisciplinary and kind of jumps from the data side to writing, you know, server side code to JavaScript code, all in like the same week or same project. So, a lot of, historically, a lot of people just jumped in and like started um, fixing bad data files or crawlers. But as we're growing now, we have people that don't know how to fix different things. Um, you develop this dashboard. This is like boss dashboard, it's kind of uh, like the back end like going live. And here we have the data dumps. So here, these are any errors or reports to say, like, hey, we're missing a file, or one of the importers isn't running. Um, this, so actually, let me back up for a second. We have this concept called uh, on call a lot of companies do, where every week or two, someone's in charge of, make, of being available if something goes wrong with this site. You know, being on call to help resolve any issue with the site staff or something's not working. Um, we have an additional kind of dimension to that, and not only the site's working, that we're actually ingesting data. Because this, all this data is coming in 24-7. You know, every day, every minute, we're getting more data. So if we, if we have a hiccup, Sometimes it could be minor. Oh, we could just get it later. Or sometimes we miss some data now, we can't get it back. In some sources, they don't have any historical data. So this on-call on component has this um, concept of checking the like, data errors going on. Um, before, you'd have to like, log into our servers, run some obscure commands, seize, um, like run a bunch of MySQL or all commands to see what's going on. It wasn't very easy or, or, or visible. So we built these tools to help um, identify the errors and, and start running documentation to help um, solve some of these data confidence issues. So I think the, our biggest tool against finding data, I think the data confidence is just um, kind of monitoring and identifying whether there's a problem and where it is, kind of the canary in the coal in the, in the mine. Because once we know that the problem is a lot easier to fix, versus we don't hear about it until two months later when the client says, hey, why is this day and no data? Which we always want to avoid. Um, Do you find that you work with this kind of like this image of you know very laid back, lots of data to go, oh, it's the music industry, we'll get to the data when we feel like it, or are some of these still more more corporate? Like, hey, we have an SLA version that they're supposed to deliver. We have an SLA. We have an SLA on all our APIs. We don't have an SLA on data confidence because how do you measure that? But if you're measuring that correctly, then you're hopefully fixing that too. So you don't want to, um, but we're thinking of different ways of kind of measuring that too. You see here at the bottom, I can't see it, but there's the 
here is the bottom here. At the bottom of the report, we have what are called data notices. And they indicate that, hey, there's some, something that you're viewing in this date range with these metrics, this data set. There's some, there's some data missing or not, not correct. Um, it's more visible on other reports. Um, but basically, that's indication to user that some of this data uh, might be a little off for like, this particular date because the API was down or we were just delaying getting the file. Um, so that's one maybe one way to quantify like, how well we're doing it. We can make this number zero, then we're doing a pretty good job if, we're, if this number is actually accurate. That was pretty much it. I just kind of had this vision in my head of you know, the music industry being oh, very right. like, oh, like, you know. Well, actually, um, I didn't know until recently how uh, how our clients actually use Next Big Sound. Um, I sat, I listened in on a call with a, I think it's, maybe it's CMT or CAA. It was a, like a country music um, music station or channel. And they actually use next big sound to figure out which videos they should play every week, which is pretty pretty crazy. Um, but we also have um, partnerships with sort of brands and artists where we actually have to deliver like these are the ten artists we think you should partner with. And they want sometimes they want them tomorrow or yesterday. So there is definitely like a pressure to deliver good results because there are millions of dollars for the talent. So yeah, we don't we don't take it lightly. It's it's a tough problem. It's still corporate. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, definitely. From I'm just curious because of that, um, from a business standpoint, also the data that you're collecting for some of these record labels, are you giving them access to it then for that data? Because I'm sure they don't share it lightly. Oh well, so they have the way it works is um, they're they, the distributed work comes to Sony. Universal, their data goes through them. We have agreements with Universal and Sony to get data. So if, let's say, they're, uh, they're not going to those companies, they don't want to share it with us, then we don't, we don't see it. Does Universal get to see Sony's data and vice versa? Is that an issue? Come on. You can't. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that, that's important yeah. issue, too. Um, we actually have an issue with us, the Spotify. The Spotify, we have a dedicated view to Spotify. We can't give access to anybody because if they can see Spotify directly, then why would they pay Spotify to do that? So we have to kind of anonymize it and by aggregation, combine it with some other data and show that it's positive. So that's one way we, we can expose it back to the rest of our um, So actually, that kind of raises another interesting question. You get data from various different sources, and the question is from the standpoint of, your, of the company business model standpoint, you're obviously paying for quite a bit of that data. So how do you, how can you measure the value of the data? So if you're getting data from say Spotify or from Sony over a period of time and you made, how do you, how can you measure that the data feed that you're getting from this company is actually giving you X amount of revenue and then you can make a decision to either get less data or turn it off because they're not giving you any value. Like how do you measure the attribution of where the data come from and tie it to revenue and say, we're gathering these five sources and yes, it's worth it, we need to add three more or we should turn off this one or that one. So that may have gotten more in the past. Um, but now, in the past we had the self-serve product where you could pay like 20 bucks a month and get full access to the platform as, a, just as an artist or just anybody. But we just phased that out and we, we made some parts of our product completely free. Um, but tools like this are uh, part of the enterprise plan. So for like large organizations that, that pay you know, tens of thousands of dollars for like a long contract. So there's less correlation then to kind of clear the data source and it's revenue. It's the revenue is kind of a longer period of time. Um, and I guess a lot of times the data sources that do charge a lot of money are really valuable. It's like uh, Twitter or Spotify, whereas ones that don't matter you know, um, are usually free. If they're not, well, then we can decide whether or not we're most important. But I can't think of any specific cases where you've dropped a data source because of cost. You usually drop it because 
say, um, like Deezer, for example. I think that's, that has some issues and it's not too serious because it's it's not a big network for us. Very little consumption users, so it's not as strong a market. Can I ask you to say something to the just scroll down a little bit. Yeah. Uh, that, that, what uh, about the rail? That thing that you mentioned is important for you as a measure to see if you're going to rail or great or not. That tells you if you get information from a data source or not. Um, I see that translated to what you say in a corporate company, corporate world. We get a mutual identity, we as they usually grow, they buy season from small companies, and they later have to integrate. So okay. with us, it's not a real problem, because if I don't see the data from the bank department, it's too wrong. You can get that today. So whatever. The dashboard is OK, the visualization is OK. For me, the real value is what you got from. I can customize that database event, gather the information that I want from the for the real money is because I am used to see dashboard for all over the place where they see, okay, the main is or the marketing department or the but they are not able to answer what is happening here today. How they gather that information, what is happening. Like, uh, as an example, if you don't know uh, the interview, what happened is the day after Kim Jong says, how do I gather the information from the new from the media? That's the real value for me, what I see there. Yeah. If I can customize that for my business, that would be great. Yeah. So there is a cookie color or a template for startups, startups, to start doing that kind of data gathering. Um, are your crawlers proprietary, or do you use They're all custom. They're all custom. Yeah. Okay. It's not like you went out there like the equivalent of Wizard D4 or D3. They can yeah. buy like, a tool that already kind of gives you the infrastructure. Uh, infrastructure, maybe not, but they're a tool. They're, a, they're like open source library. Is stuff, basically, right? Uh, I can't. I don't know the name now, but there are lots of services that you can. You get, you go to a website. You tell this is how you scrape the data. You have to highlight the data you want on the page, and it'll actually create an API for you to fetch it. Restoring it and then aggregating that, that's uh, so it's support to do that. So that gives you the scraper piece. You still got to yeah. go solve the storage piece. Yeah. Um, but uh, <coughs> what you're saying is, uh, is about that. I don't know if you've seen that before, but it's looking for a set called not, no or something like that. No, I think, um, no, no, what Excel is just like a kind of tools of speeds of network analysis. Oh, okay, okay, okay. So, like a graph, graph, yeah. graph. Okay. Yeah, this is, um, yeah, that's specifically specific to Facebook, okay. right? Um, yeah, I mean, a lot of, so we started in YouTube, right? But now we've also ventured into the book publishing industry. We have we own the next big book dot and we're actually partnering with um, we're actually working with Macmillan. Um, you can see this is actually a Macmillan um, uh, the slot these the slides I showed you before. These are from Macmillan actually. So we're working with them and this fe feature here is actually for them. So the needs between the book and the publishing industry, music, brands, film even, it's all the same ideas, like you said, it's kind of the same ideas, getting data online, you know, and being able to see what's going on. We're going to get them into politics. Politics, too? Yeah. Yeah. Did you try, were there any other um, big ideas? There's one more thing I wanted to show you here. That was, so this is where we getting pretty tall. And, you know, as, as I start moving, as I start uh, ex 
expanding this, like getting the game closer together, after a while it's going to be so scrunched up that I won't be able to really use it. So we did this little thing here where it converts it into oh, features. After a while. So you can actually see. You can see what's going on. This shows more like density than anything. Oh, that's awesome. Did somebody complain? Yeah. Is that what it is? They went, no, we can't. Well, actually, uh, it kind of started, so we had this need from our clients. We had a request to do something like this, right? And as part of that, I was looking at this and I was like, I hate this. It's so, it, I can't use this. Just, I wanted to like a time series up here. So then we started experimenting with the ideas of using these clouds and stuff. And then, um, as I was playing around with it, or as I was playing around with the idea, you know, it, it became pretty evident that like, once you have a lot of events, you were really like a big as it is, you can How do you start making it more manageable? That still actually provides some information. Because this is like, I mean, you can tell, okay, there are a lot of events here, but like, what's going on? Like, why is there a spike that I don't know? You have to start filtering, right? Um, to start seeing anything you know, useful. But I also want to see a cool density view. Um, I don't know how I came up. I went to the density stuff this morning, actually. Um, it's, I guess all this stuff is pretty, it's still fresh. It's like a rug, um, a rug plot, I think. is. Uh, it's very similar to that, but what it uses is it takes um, you know, split the data up into quantiles or percentiles, mm -hmm. say like every 10% or whatever. And you know, if the data is dense in that area, you'll, you'll see those bundle up. It looks very similar. Oh, this was this is very this is very simple actually. Um, this is just I took these, put them all on the same same level, put the opacity to 10%. So was that a facility that D3 was providing? And then you were able to adapt it for this particular graph? Um, yeah, I just changed the way that data was transformed. I detected, okay. like, I detected if the way we do the stacking here is we figure out, OK, how wide will this cloud be under that? OK, if it's over here, the minimum width is like 10 pixels wide. Now, if I have a, a day that if I have an event that spans like two days, and it's going to be less than 10 pixels wide, then we're pretty far zoomed out. So we should probably start doing some different visualization. There's no way you can go click it. And the same thing if it gets too tall, we can decide, okay, let's let's make let's uh, change the visualization because it's um, it's not going to be useful. So we just we kind of we took a lot of the feedback from the client about the frustrations and that they found with the initial versions of this and kind of thought like, okay, it's really annoying that it's tall. And I still and I, I want to see it. Why would I want to see events zoomed out this far? Oh, because I just want to see like where are they clustering. So then oh okay heat. So that's kind of how we arrived at that solution. See that visualization, right? What's that? It's the epitome of visualization. So yeah.
probably that Facebook post will trigger something and people are looking. But I don't want to go to the graph and, and kind of look for a gem. Because it's, it's, it's still a lot to you have to explore. Yeah, right? explore, right? Yeah. It's and still very exploratory. It's exploratory, but if, if, if there's a way to like streamline reports for the people, and that could be even on another service. Like if you want monthly reports with insights, like actionable insights, in terms of, that could be expensive. Yeah, actually, so you're, that's actually that's our, our vision, really. Because this is still only at the knowledge of information. Right. It's not telling you what you need to do. Yeah, it's not that. It allows you to discover why certain things happened in the past. But um, we have. We have. Uh, so ideally, we'd love to be able to have these predictive kind of alerts that say, you listen to your album, the next, the next day or two, you get an automated email from us saying, it looks like you released an album. We recommend going on these talk shows to talk about. We know that will increase your, your uh, sales. Um, we have some, sorry, some other <coughs> things. So I'm going more to the intelligence side. Taking that graph tool, we can now we can kind of give you some predictions as to where um, you know, where any metric for some artist could be. So let's say search for, um, give me a name of someone that's rising, rising star. Lord. So this is what we predict. James likes to do so. It's all right. Interesting, interesting story about Wikipedia. We found that Wikipedia is directly correlated to sales for an artist. Um, and if you think about it in the sense of before you go buy a, an album for an artist, you sometimes will go on Wikipedia, read about them, check out their whole um, discography, and you go from there. So we found that something a lot of people do. Right? So if you don't if you don't have some of the sales data, well, we'll look at their Wikipedia data to see what their sales are like. What are their APIs like? The Wikipedia? Yeah. Um, oh, it's, actually, I, I, never, I never heard it directly, but we get a lot of data very easily. Yeah. Um, no, I, I have one question with regard to the API itself. Um, and given the, the amount of processing that you're doing, either in front end or in back end, another data visualization, I don't think that APIs that you're exposing to, to third parties, how, how much of that processing power is, is, being, is being done on, on the back end of the call of the API and how much, is, how much raw data you're feeding outside? As an example, I would say, for the graph that we were seeing, the one that has both open lines plus posts, that looks like a tremendous amount of data to be flushed out on, on, a, on a single API call, single or several, you know, even if you can chuck it out on several calls with timestamps and binding. So what kind of data are you, is, for example, is that data API, it's on an API exposed on site, or you got selected type of data that, that is being exposed? No, every, everything is exposed to the API. Like nothing kind of served up with the page. It's all your third party, your our third party API. Um, so any client can consume that. But like you said, yeah, we have a problem right now where this is one giant API. Actually, no, we batch these. These, are, uh, these, events, are, these events are fetched in batches uh, through multiple calls. Um, but the data is all just one call, but it's all aggregated on the server. We don't get raw data back. We get the data values that we want to show here, including the time. I mean, there's probably like a thousand, like at most, maybe a thousand when you say like data points or so. Like, that's not. It's, tell me, I think about it. It's not crazy if it's already like sitting there, you know, like available. Yeah. Yeah.
the part of the product that's now completely free. It's the artist profile. And this is where a lot of our other data science um, kind of comes into play. So here, we, sh we show these um, kind of different stages. It's a metric trend, the social stage, engagement, and their reach. And these are a combination of um, different uh, metrics. And see this text here is all is all auto, is all generated text. So none of this is handwritten. We actually, based on um, our, a, our API that uh, makes these uh, kind of aggregates these values, we put together this, this content kind of like in a series way or map wolf from the alpha way. So this is one of the most probably most interesting visualizations that we have, and which is actually just text where we take. And she's 90th percentile. She's been adding a ton of Twitter followers, which is um, 5,000 times more than anybody else. So this is a kind of a cool way to see um, how some how different artists compare. And here, this again, this is going into the information layer. We see the breakdown of what her, what her strongest demographics are. Which age groups? So all, all that information, sorry, all, all that information, you got it available free on API? No, free through the site. Oh, free through yeah. the site. You don't have an API for that. Oh, we have an API for that. And actually, no, you, you could, technically, if you log in, you can hit the API, because it's all just an access token based. So you grab your access token, you just hit the API directly. You're good to go. You could, but you might violate terms of service and end Yeah, we, I mean, we have a, you can do it. We're not watching anybody right. doing that, and we'll find out pretty quickly because our <laughs> service is, yeah. You had mentioned that you're going to do, you're going to do books now, and you're, you're looking into the next big books or something like that. Oh, we already have it, so if you go to, no, so, we already. So what, is, so what are you measuring in, in the books as far as, are you measuring your sales, or are you measuring like uh, user uh, feedback on the books, or? Uh, multiple things. Kind of similar thing as the music, right? When they uh, listen to, when they buy a book, Audible.com, or Goodreads, or Barnes and Noble in store, or online, um, when they write a review, post a comment sometimes. We try a lot of the same things. I can show you here. So this is a book. Let's, let's edit one of the data sets. So here, this is a, for the book, we have all these different things we can track. Anything from marketing spend, which this has to be given to us by our clients, to uh, page views, Google Analytics stuff. A lot of those things, same concepts. If it can be tracked online, we can, we can follow it. So, so you're, sorry, sorry. So you're actually with that, you're turning yourself into, into a full-time aggregator of all the information from even an artist that says, Okay, I already have some presence on Instagram, my web page, and everything else. And I got my Google Analytics account and X and Y and Z. Then I just provide you with information, and you aggregate it to the conglomerate of the rest of the information about Spotify, SoundCloud, etc., to provide you a better insight. Yeah, exactly. You can actually. So let's say you you want to track. And that will kind of bank, for example. I'll show you. This is, this is where you can add new sources for a particular artist or author. Here. What if the book hasn't been launched yet? And well, we, uh, we track pre orders for, for the clients we work with. So they give us their like, Amazon pre order um, information. You guys are something like based on, based on the data that you've gotten and based on. Uh, could you guys predict maybe best times to, to do something or best times to, to launch interviews? <laughs> I mean, here, this is a good example. This is um, Amazon pre-orders, and this is book sales. You can see they switch when the book is released on this date. But uh, you can use this to um, pinpoint. So right here, you see there's a nice little spike here. And that is because, I don't know this earlier,
Oh, actually, no, what's, yeah, what's pi to the Or you can use this, to, the way our clients are using it is to see which advertisements, and which marketing spend is the most fruitful. Right. So for here, like some Facebook promotions, book browse, for this one here that didn't do anything, Facebook, so maybe Facebook's not that great. This provides a little more ammunition for them to see where should they put the market at. Right. But it's the same concept. Could this type of data and analytics be used for, uh, or what, what do you guys provide for, like say a young or newer artist that is trying to get into the industry and they really haven't figured out their marketing strategy yet, they haven't built their world around you know, their social media presence and things like that. I mean, like for example, you mentioned Wikipedia. Well, I'm pretty sure that most young bands don't know that they probably should have a pretty full Wikipedia page because that becomes useful. So. Is there an ability with, like, for bands, if they're consumers of this information, just tracking themselves and they say, what's missing in my sort of social media presence? What do I need to do to get more coverage? Should I put myself on Wikipedia? Like, how can you use this information to show them the gaps of what they're missing so to get them a better presence? Oh, um, that's exactly what we, we built a profile page for. Where it's like, it's like a Even almost predicting when would be the best time to launch yeah. a new book, or should they go for a series as opposed to one book launch or something like yeah, that? Yeah. So here, um, they would use the new profile. So overwork, he's a, a Canadian DJ. Yeah. And relatively new, um, modest age, right? But we can, using this tool, you can see, okay, he's got a strong following, 18 to 22. No women. Yeah. Mostly in France. Like, okay. So this kind of helps inform where his holes are. <laughs> but that gives, that tells you where sort of the gaps are in demographics. Yeah. But as far as the possible social media outlets, maybe they're not doing so strong on Facebook. They don't have a Wikipedia page. You know, they're they're kind of okay on Twitter, but showing where those gaps are, and then say, you know, what? we need to get better. We need to do more interaction on Facebook. We need to tweet more. We need to flush out our Wikipedia page. Like help them fill in those gaps. Sure. So let's say uh, let's say BTs is kind of they feel like they're similar artists to them. They want to get the same level. So we have this comparison tool here. You can search for BT. And then it will compare side by side to uh, so kind of the SoundCloud, Sound, yeah, SoundCloud, YouTube, Facebook. With, like this is reach, for example. But but interesting though, you're comparing. But back to Andrew's point there, I think I, I can see where you're going. But what what events within the history of that artist propelled that artist? to now get into 300 spins on SoundCloud as opposed to the 100? Like what event, is there a series of events that you can predict now to tell an artist you need to do A, B, C, D, E, and then your SoundCloud profile will become X amount greater? Yeah, we're not there yet. That is something, that's how we discovered um, in the course of Wikipedia, the, the Jimmy Fallon effect, right, from the main IT show. <coughs> Um, I think to do that, we've been identifying, um, th this is a tough problem. What we need to do is... It's like an aggregate of aggregates. Like well, you have well, to get... We, we, we developed a, a, a statistical yeah. model for, for a kind of progression of an artist. And we kind of see which one best predicts across all the ones we've seen so far. We do something similar similar to that for, um, It's almost like you're going to have to measure a, like an impact score per event type. So for example, you have that late night TV show and how many times has that caused a spike 
in, you know, in sales and at what's, what is the actual level of that spike. So if that happens all the time, then you give a greater score to late night TV interviews. Yeah. Uh, or if you have you know, the, that pre-book or that pre-sale huge spike in sales the day after. So you give more weight to those events and then those become indicators where you can present to somebody saying, I'm here, my goal is to get there. And then you can give them a list of 10 things that say, we know from the past that these have been the biggest impacts that you can try to get your score up higher. Or you can give them a recommendation. If you do this, you're gonna increase by 10%. If you do that, you're gonna increase by 20%. You sort of give them a path to increase their, their visibility and their sales. But it would be based on more than that because you have to look at the type of artist. Right. You know, of course, there's lots so many of other, points. All the factors yeah. that make that artist, that particular the type of writings they have, et cetera, and bring that into the predictability of what's gonna right. happen I mean, if you, you change you, track. You, it starts off by analyzing the, data, the, the right. demographics and genre-based so specific awesome. artists. Let's say you can take this DJ, right? Mostly males, 18 to 22-year-olds, DJ. Uh, so you can kind of discern the specific genre and the specific demographics, and then you compare that to an existing DJ that's much bigger than he is, uh, with similar demographics, similar genre, similar background, uh, that's much further along in his career, and then look at that data points that got him to where he is in that career, and look at the history and then maybe do a predictive analysis of what that new DJ should follow in terms of those data points that got that other DJ to the, where he was. And then based on those, it recommend, hey, so-and-so did this, you should do this because you have a similar background. It's, just, uh, uh, it's, it's a recommendation system. Yeah, uh, right. People that have about this, have also about that. Right. Oh, do you to look into that because it's more than that. It's, it's, very, it's very difficult though because whereas your sample size is much smaller, yeah. and your number of uh, affecting factors is way more. And we, have, we actually did plot, there's something called that, we kind of we, we track, actually, we, um, we calculate, it's called the Billboard 200 likelihood, and this is a report we publish every year that says, yeah. these five, these 100 artists, uh, we believe, are gonna be in the top Billboard next year. And we're about 20, 30% right. No, I know, but that's, that's, that's just There's assumption yeah. that, 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 so like, and what he said over there, you know, if you look at a larger artist chasing that back, there's assumptions that like history, the history of yesterday will be like exactly. a Exactly, I was gonna, I was gonna bring up that, so, I agree with him totally. You, the, the culture, what's happening in the culture at that time, will the impact be the same? Yeah, yeah. This is it's more. a strict predictive analytics problem, like it's like, you know, there, there's probably a billion ways to like attack it or whatever, but like. Do you guys have like a, do you guys have like a PhD statistician on staff <laughs> to like tackle some of the algorithms? You guys want to play the stock market, you know? Uh, 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 our data scientists go up for the Yankees, like Michael and Tennessee before. So yeah, it's crazy, crazy data. Actually, now we do have a PhD. Okay. So you have that have some of that expertise in house trying to develop your predictive analytics. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming you're also some of your clients are providing you insight and you're probably getting input from them on or are you pretty focused on just providing that? Does that, does that make sense? How do you without going into detail, how do you figure out your predictive analytics? Is it something you develop in house? You guys study the data and you say, Hey, this this looks like it might work. Or it's a client of yours coming to you and saying, hey, this is how we've been doing this the last 10 years. We want you to kind of automate it and take it to the next step. Is that a question? Maybe? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I think this arises a lot with our with brand, the work we do with brands. Um, so let's say a brand comes to us, wants a list of five artists they want to partner with for this around the US tour. They want to do a commercial tour. And it goes to demographic data. Well, they, they ask, they give us a target demographic and we figure out who best to work with them. So for each of these, these are like custom client reports that we, that we build for these clients. And I think we established a um, kind of an approach beforehand, like the research and development process to get there. And I, we communicate that with our clients. But I think it's, it's more us coming up with the ideas. It's, that's that's our, what we do for a living. And um, a lot of times, these brands, it, you know, 
father would ask his daughter, hey, what are you listening to? Right? And that's what he would base his decision on, on who his partner was to the brand. So, uh, but they're much more open to using data to form the decision than music was. Um, so it's, I think it's still a little bit more of a long way street because some of the brands, you don't have data scientists and statisticians usually as much as analysts come, analysts come here with. So, but um, I, want to, I want to circle back on that predictive part because it's Billboard 200. This is what we tried this Billboard for. Um, it's kind of like a pseudo predictive score. It's, it's a uh, likelihood that they'll hit the charts. We track it over time. And we tracked, we did a, a time series of everyone who's ever hit the Billboard 200, what did that you know, time series look like over time? Was there a pattern? You know, did they all follow the same kind of trend? And the result was just kind of a giant mess. It, was <laughs> it wasn't a clear progression because like you were mentioning, the culture is different, the inputs are different. So much stuff is different, and it's a small sample size. There might be, there is some kind of, um, there's some stages that we that we can identify, like, uh, back to this guy. Um, we can identify like different stages here, you know, everything from, Undiscovered, promising, established mainstream effort. These are these are um, thresholds at which we feel you know, separate the artists at the different points in their careers um, in a kind of demonstrable way. But that, that again, it's very you have to you have to look at the data and figure it out. So being able to automate, kind of, if you're this type of artist, then do this, then do that, is extremely difficult. But first, we have to identify, like Andrew was saying, this type of event is way more influential than this type of event. Um, and to be able to do that, we need something called like anomaly detection, which means first we need good data. We like, like, have spikes every two days. You know? So it's it's kind of this whole domino effect. And that's what we're trying to do. The point of the point where I, ideally our whole product would just be through email. And you just sign up, and you know, once in a while you get an email that says, "Hey, you should do this. Go, go do an interview about this. You should release your album in two weeks, not today. It would be better for this reason." And just be this kind of like a butler telling you what to do. That's it. But that that that's where the real challenge lies. I mean, that's where it is. Yeah, I I found. There are predictive, they do have a predictive analytics engine. It is the user sitting in front of those graphs. You know, and, and I think what's, what's kind of, uh, what I've noticed is that people will look at data scientists, they'll look at statisticians, like it's their job to produce this like answer like that. Where, and that's very hard, a lot of things can go wrong in that. But if you instead shift to how can we leverage this data so that someone can look with their own eyes and use their own mind, a person against a computer looking at a given image is going to kill that computer all day long. The power of the computer is that it can do millions and millions of images in a suboptimal way. So like when I look at that graph, that's what I think is the prediction engine, you're enabling the, the user to be the prediction engine. But that's only if you know how to actually yeah. look, okay. well, know what that's to look true. for that's and true. know what to do based on what you find. That's true. And I think some of the predictive analytics really, yes, it is about the data, data in, data out, so whatever you put into it. Right. So really it comes down to, from a product standpoint, what data points, what intuitive data points do we want to present to the user? How do we want to enable the user? What can we feed to them? and lead them to an answer. And the more you give them, depending on right. what the product is, you have to kind of carve that out. And then you present that to them as clear as possible and sort of train the user saying, I'm pushing you this way, make that choice. So that was one other question I have for you. This was one of the challenges. We're in the midst of finishing up a dashboard project right now. And in the beginning of the project, we went through and we outlined the requirements of the project. We took input from the user community. Until the end, they came up with this requirement where they said, well, we don't know what we don't know yet. So we want you to make this tool that just allows us to go explore the data on our own, and we can't tell you the requirement right now. Well, that's, that's actually the deep difference between data reporting and data mining. 
So data reporting, you know what you want to care about, so you know the data points and you build dashboards and KPIs and whatnot. But then when you don't know the question, yeah. that's when you do the data mining and it becomes exploratory. And there's a whole field of, you know, the whole industry built around data mining tools and you know it's like a cottage industry around. So what our challenges was to get a team like that for the handout there, which is great, but allow them to drill down through it. Also to be able to aggregate all this big data because once you don't know what they're gonna ask, how do you, you know, up front aggregate that data so it'll still perform? I didn't know if you had any of those similar challenges yet, or you're more, you know, this is the, you know, the constraints, or these are the requirements that we're working with right now to provide. Well, uh, it's both, actually, because, because here, so this is exactly an exploratory tool. This is a data mining tool, because you have to tell it. Obviously, it has some limit. some point, it only, it provides what you provide access to. Or else someone has to provide that access to it, right? Okay. Yeah. Um, the, the, uh, the challenge is. Um, uh, I'm sorry, I lost the train. If I can mention real quick, uh, I think you can go through all the detailed information in the dashboard. There's a point when you have to break out the build down as an example, and make sure the company you compare several lines of business, then you see it's private. Like what goes, okay, you need to check it. So you do it down, okay, to the area. Okay, so the area there is a mark. Okay, there's a point where you have to roll the clip and bring another clip as the parameters. Go to the report where you see all the policies you have and so on. Oh, look, it's going to be well. Yeah, so this one thing is actually that, that kind of, uh, it's kind of manual in, in the past we did something like that and we'll build down. Yeah, well, so the, the, the profile of this, this is monitor, right? Because you know, you, based on you know settings, you specify which metric, metrics you care about. And here this shows you what database and what those metrics. This exploratory tool here, um, so there, like you said, this is pretty limited. We have all the tools that we use internally when generating client reports that allow us to slice and dice the data in lots of different ways in that intermediate layer. Because all this stuff is slightly modified. This is like, these are deltas, not tables, and um, that's where we go up to our, our lower layer. You can, you know, you write an Apache Pick script. You're or, writing. Uh, I'm not writing, but okay. we, we do, yeah, we actually, I don't know if we have a visible interface to it. But oh, here we go. Ah, this is okay. This is the <laughs>
So is that how much money he's making <laughs> just by tweeting? This is this is kind of his um, the value of his market share. Yeah, you know, yeah. The value of, the value of his general presence and reach and engagement on on the on Twitter. Yeah. So does that indicate as a result of his social media presence, that's how much money he's earning in music sales? No, no. This is if someone wanted to make the same gains um, in social media as he did in the past 30 days, they'd have to spend 10 million. Oh. 10 million. Okay. Oh. They have that same effect. So that's his wow. cost. That's, well, that's how much the, his social media is valued. His oh, okay. It's so it's, it's an abstract value, basically. It's a, it's a derived value. Yeah, basically, derived value basically, if you wanted to do equivalent advertising, you'd have to spend that yeah. much money to make that happen. Yeah, yeah. This is the, yeah, exactly. Um, this is how we, this is how we can be used to uh, um, uh, validate whether or not to throw a bunch of advertising at, at something. There's one more, I have to ask the link for it, because I can't remember, but, it was an affinity analysis. So let's say I'm, uh, let's say I'm Budweiser, and I want to reach, I want to reach 18 to 20 year old men before they go to college. How how do I how do I get there? The Budweiser, let's say if you get a Venn diagram of their kind of influence and who like them, say that there's a circle here. And then their target demographic is over here. And there's no overlap. Well, how do you get to them? Through a, um, a common shared brand or artist or other, something else. So maybe this one singer here has overlap in terms of their audience. They have people that are 18 to 20 old males, and also have people that, um, like Budweiser is. is is a good choice so they, they made well with it. So by partnering part with the, that artist, they can reach that, that, that demographic. So did you say Budweiser is looking to reach out to 18 to 20 year old males to yeah, sell? I just use that example. But <laughs> <laughs> Are you um, suggesting? <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, that, I wish I could show because that's a cool visual, like, visualization to kind of see, like I want to get, I want to get to this lily pad of demographics and I'm over here. This artist can help me get there because if someone who likes this artist likes me and likes that thing I want to um, uh, get to, so um, yeah, I wish I could show that. Well, could it, could it, an artist actually use that for their own marketing promotion? So, that, for instance, Kanye wants to promote uh, Pepsi. Uh, could he go to Pepsi now and say, "Hey, I I I, uh, I put this on my Instagram one time. And you're gonna get an average cost of nine million dollars." I mean, I don't know if, well, so this is not, oh, like these values. Okay, like the value of me promoting your products. If my market, my social media right. marketing reach is now a commodity, <laughs> and now I can go approach multiple potential sponsors and say, hey, I, my, the value of my social media presence is this amount. If you want access to that, you can pay me X amount of dollars and I'll tweet for you. Yeah, yeah. I think you should call Kanye and talk to him. 
you tackle that brand right so you're talking about let's step away from just the products that they sell the services that they sell at some higher level you have to aggregate it to the brand so then you'd almost have to say for this brand here's all the products and services at some aggregate level plot that against the graph and then say here's your current trajectory you should do X Y and Z to compete with these other competitors I mean that comes again back to almost like it like I said an aggregate of aggregates I mean that involves like exponentially more data. I mean, you already have a ton of data, but exponentially more data again, just to get to that point. Like, how do you begin? How would you take your current expertise in the domain that you're in and expand it into that area? Like, how would you get there based on what you know? That's you have to try. Probably, if you could solve that, you'd be a billionaire. Yeah. <laughs> well, the thing with brands is the way people see like, are exposed to them is different. Than Way more nuanced or industry specific than the art. How do you track events around a brand, talk, talking about a brand? It's less direct. You don't buy a brand's album or buy a book. Mm -hmm. you, know, you might you have to track their sales, which that's, that's a different for every company. It's a whole other level. Um, but if you get Amazon, does your, yeah. does your does your company um, partner with marketing companies to get that type of information? Because they're the ones that really promote brands. Some type of marketing specialist, you know. That. Usually, the brands that we work with would give us that data, right? Oh, they, they have contracts with because them. they have contracts with someone. So but you're talking about branding itself and being able to produce that, you know, the products for for branding. You know, branding is in general, so much yeah. like you said. So how you know 
does your company have they thought about how they're going to approach that? I mean, what we so we were we started maybe last year, maybe last year, thinking about brands as a as a kind of the next thing after books that we might want to look at. And just this year, we like fully kind of or committing to think, looking at it with more intensity to see what, what kind of what the what it would be like, but. It's still pretty early to tell how how we're going to do it, how we're going to kind of scale that. Or is it even viable? I mean, I would imagine a lot of the bigger companies already do a lot of that themselves. I mean, they got they're the ones that have the horsepower and the finances to you know think about the big brands like GM or Nabisco. I'm sure they have teams of people handling that for all of their internal brands. I would imagine that the mid market would be a perfect place to target because those are the folks that. They're focused on their product and their marketing team is focused on advertising, not necessarily predictive analytics, and they don't really have the team to put together or the resources to put together. So that would be, a, for me, if I was a mid-market, mid-level mid size company, that would be perfect. I don't, we have domain expertise in this market, but we're not data people. Just go buy a service that can feed me that information. Yeah. Uh, to me, I think that would be a perfect target to go after. Yeah, um, well, even with big brands too, um, we've seen lots of big companies who worked with us in the past say, oh, we can do this data stuff. We'll do go on and do it on our own. They, they don't go anywhere because it's a hard problem. And yeah. if your main business is this brand doing data too, because it's not just your sales you have to track, it's how people perceive you. And it's us everywhere. So doing it all in-house is, is crazy if that's not your kind of thing. Sure. But yeah, mid-market, I mean, it's, because they wouldn't even think about trying to do that. That's a playground right there. Yeah. Let's go for it. Um, yeah, and I think Lyft would uh, create a, a prize. Maybe so a oh, yeah, yeah. For the creators of the algorithm who can predict what movie can it cost where it's going to see next. Yeah, it could be done for some more yeah. than what the actual was. Yeah, there's actually, like, there's, um, uh, have you guys heard of the one? Yeah, it's kind of, this is the same idea. Kaggle, it's mm. data, data science competitions yeah. with cash prizes, so if you can, um, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty cool. So it's kind of the same idea. We're even toying around with ideas of doing that, you know, opening up our data set and saying, hey, if you can get us better results, better predictions, and, it's a good interview technique. Yeah. Give them a subset of data with a hard problem and say, come back in a week and if you solve it, you got the job. Yelp. Well, I think <laughs> Yelp is that. Yelp. Oh, Yelp is that. Yelp. Yeah. They host a competition with most of my interviews. Oh, cool. I yeah. We actually, um, we actually, that as part of our data engineering channel, we have this. Actually, I don't know one of our problems is actually the subset of our data and it has to actually identify anomalies, cohort sentiment um, using some of our tools. And then we actually have that as part of our interview, which is crazy. Um, but yeah, predictive stuff for brands is really. As, as far as collecting the data yeah. in social media, have you started? Because a lot of the services and APIs, I understand, they're not necessarily retroactive. And I'm assuming that like, you're, you're starting to crawl artist pages after you've identified that that artist page exists or that artist exists. But to try to get the historic data, I don't know if that's always as easy. Depends on the service. Some services only do those delta every day. Like, we'll never know a total value because we we never started at the beginning. Others. You do this, but you don't have to. Or others even let us, even let us query historical data. Um, so if we call this through up, we lost it, we didn't do anything for data, we can go back to one and get it. Sometimes we don't, we just don't have any data like the rest of the day. Do you try to collect more than you might need now so that you can be prepared later? Um, well, yeah, it's all, it's. Like if you're getting Wikipedia data or out of like, Oh, I see. So we crawl even if, and so if I search for someone here, say, 
ethics and the nonsense and the none of the system. But we found we found this artist in one of our endpoints that we call like Spotify or something. We'll actually grab the data. Um, so when someone comes in and they adds actually adds the artist, they'll already have the data. Because this just adds a like relational entry in our data there. Um, as soon as you search. Yes. No, as soon as you when you enter when you fill out like when I add a new artist or, or whatever. Okay. This just has an entry in a relational system. But the data we collect, collect separately. And only later do we actually have it together. So yeah, so as, to be clear, you manually Yeah. Well no, this is this is just this is more like a profile of the whatever. Yeah, like a label like hey, uh, and I'll try to find match data that matches you know, based on based on the endpoints you how, how long does that take to pull back? Um, I don't know, maybe a day, maybe less. After you add a profile? I just added a profile. Oh, yeah? So I'll find out tomorrow. <laughs> oh, yeah, well, what's the name? Okay, so, Juana, they want to. Juana, they want to. Yeah, they pull back her picture. It's just a. Oh, okay. What's the Juana? Uh, Juana, back, Juana. This was added about two hours ago. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, I think our crawlers were on. They run in the mornings, like three or four So, theoretically, tomorrow you could potentially start finding data related to that entry. Yeah, you probably see, like, look at the Wikipedia entry here tomorrow. Probably see some. Did you hook up your Facebook insights or just Facebook? Oh, just Facebook. I don't see it. I probably won't see a demographic breakdown. Maybe on Twitter. Okay. Oh, that'd be interesting. Um, yeah, actually, some of our guys did too. What's on our dead box? No, for example, with that case, we're. You, you, if there is a problem between the names and the tax office, there is no way to resolve it. For example, a spotter of one elements and found her database. Yeah. Because it, it was included right now by Charles. But for example, say that it, it pops up, can be brought from SoundCloud tomorrow the crop. So you will get a profile and maybe it has a coma. It's not a problem. You know. There's no way to reconcile it to data, so you want to have a true problem. No, there, there would be. Um, Thank you. The way, way, so it's, it's the way it's connected, so he connects, when he connects Spotify, for example, he's connecting very uh, like a Spotify user on the actual identifier. The same identifier that we that we receive from Spotify when we get to the feed. They're not doing it automatically for us. We're waiting for artists to work. So we're collecting the data before we may have the artists like. How did you identify the data as relevant to start? You have some given an editorial team or not? Oh, no, no, we just we, we give all the spots like data. No, we just like suck it. So like give on. Um, What's your high fidelity source? And then you probably use that to look out over like, YouTube and stuff on huh? like the. Yeah, the way it's, it's kind of like a spider to take a lot of. For the, the non-file feeds, so Spotify uh, like sends us a file feed. But for other things like YouTube, or we actually, or some other sites, we actually go out and start scraping the web, websites themselves. We'll follow, the spider will follow links and use that to identify other data sources and pull those data, pull that data. Um, so sometimes they're accurate. <laughs> Let's say Twitter, they usually link off to Facebook and Instagram, all, all connected to the same artist. And then that's how we that's how we get the data. And it'll be done automatically, even if we don't have this art have this artist in our like product in the product. We'll have, still have the data um, oftentimes. I think. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah, we definitely will. So uh, we might have more historical data than than we think here. And what do we call these guys? Oh, we're just in that for science. Yeah. <laughs> I'll have to test with another instance.